Before we start, I just want to say a few thank yous. First of all, thank you to the rabbis of the Spet Knesset for inviting our program here, opening up their doors. Um, Rabbi Kassin, Rabbi Albert Sein, Rabbi Joseph Dan really did a fantastic job in helping put this entire program together. Thank you to our sponsors, um, actually all who keep up with us daily, Mr. Raymond Saka, uh, for really helping organize everything, I Chira and Sons, Ike Chira, and Alan and Joey Shama. Thank you all. So there's one huge side benefit of having this Tanakh program going daily, and that's being able to hear from these world-renowned Tanakh scholars as they come into America. We've really benefited in the p p past, and today we have a fantastic lineup, starting with uh, Dr. Yael Ziegler. She'll be giving our first class. Right after the first class, she is running to catch a flight, um, 1.30 today. So you'll all have a chance for approximately three to five minutes to buy her new, newly published book that her and her husband are selling on the far corner table over there for a discounted price of $20. <laughs> it's a fantastic book. You should all pick it up. Um, and just lastly, before, I mean, a lot of you are here. Most of you know who we're about, but we do have a daily study of the pedic. We engage with the text every single day, six days a week. Uh, it's about 20 minutes of pedic, reading the text, explaining the text. You could have a podcast. It'll come to your email. And we're following along. We're finishing Sefer Yeshayahu this week, uh, starting Sefer Yirmiyahu. Um, looks like next week, Rabbi Harold Sun will actually be teaching that Sefer on the podcast, and he'll be giving us a class introduction to Sefer Yirmiyahu uh, later today. Uh, without further ado, Dr. Yael Ziegler. Okay. Good morning. Uh, I'll start by thanking Jesse and all of you for coming. It's really amazing to see what kind of Talmud Torah is taking place here in Deal on Sunday morning, July 5th. It's very exciting. I'll just mention, um, Jesse mentioned that, that uh, I'm, I'm flying out to the airport. So I'm just going to mention that I, I did put at the bottom of these source sheets my email address because I will not have a lot of time to answer questions, and I'm, I'm, I'm sorry about that. And so I encourage anyone who has comments or questions to please email me, and I'll be happy to try to respond. Um, I'm going to be speaking today about Echa, about uh, the book that we'll be reading on Tisha B'Av, the Megillah, a book of lamentations, a book of anguish and grief. Of course, it's a, it's a book of mourning. It's a very difficult book. And while this book is technically about the fall of Yerushalayim, Technically, it's about the destruction of the Beit HaMikdash during the time of the Babylonians in 586 BCE. Uh, of course, it's appropriate that you'll be starting to learn Yirmiyahu this week because Yirmiyahu is the author also of Megillat Echa. Um, this book has also been regarded throughout Jewish history as a blueprint for Jewish mourning. Right? It's not just about the fall of Yerushalayim. It's not just about the destruction of the Beit HaMikdash. It's a book which teaches us how to contend with pain and suffering uh, within a religious context, both as individuals and as part of the community. And that's pretty much what I want to get to today. In order to get there, though, I want to talk today about Megillat Echa as a book of poetry. Okay, we have many books in Tanakh that are written as prose, that are written as narrative, and we have many books in Tanakh that are written as poetry. And this, of course, is a book of poetry. What defines this as poetry? I'm going to leave that to Intro to Poetry 101, because that, of course, is a very complex question as well. I will note, however, and this is really what we're going to be talking about a great deal of our shiur today, um, and that is that poetry is defined by the techniques that are used in order to compose the book. Techniques like meter and rhythm and word plays and structure and imagery and elevated language, right? These are all defining features as po of poetry. Of course, these features can appear in prose as well, but they are more pronounced, they're more concentrated in poetry. And some of those features are what I want to look at today. <clears throat> We're not going to have time to look at all of the features, but that's really what I want to look at today. I want to look at the techniques of writing poetry and how it appears in Megillat Echa. Now, it might sound technical and perhaps even boring. I'm going to try to show that it's neither technical nor boring, but that in fact 
form reflects content. That when you have a technique that is used to compose a book, whether it's structure or imagery or the language that is used or even the meter and the rhythm of the words that are used, it ultimately is there in order to convey meaning and especially structure. Okay, so we're going to eventually get to the structure. It is my um, <clears throat> assertion that whoever does not see the structure of Megillat Echa is going to miss its most important theological ideas, its most important religious ideas. We are learning Echa not as poetry, but of course as biblical poetry. And so we're going to look to use some of these techniques in order to more deeply understand the religious meaning of the book of Echa. But before I begin, I want to make one more point about poetry, and that is, uh, just as an introductory question, what is the purpose of poetry? Why might we write something in poetry and write something else in prose? So again, it's a little bit of a complex question. I'm going to offer it a, a very simple answer to this question, and that is that if prose is used primarily to convey facts and information. Let me tell you a story. Let me tell you what I did today. Let me tell you <clears throat> the history of uh, the Jewish people. <clears throat> Poetry is used to convey an experience or an emotion. Okay, Emotion, of course, is something that is essentially inexpressible. If I tell you my emotions in so many words, they tend to fall flat, right? They tend not to make a big impact. It's impossible to properly convey my emotions. I can tell you what I did today. It's very, very difficult to tell you what I felt today. And so poetry, which is coming to express the inexpressible, is really trying to elicit an emotional response from the reader by creating certain conditions, by creating certain feelings, what we're trying to do is to get the reader and the, the listener, right? The, the Tanakh reader is really supposed to be the Tanakh listener. Most people didn't have Tanakhs in ancient times. Instead, they heard the words of the Tanakh, they absorbed them, and they were meant to experience the emotions that, uh, that, that, that Yirmiyahu is trying to get them to experience while he is composing the book of Echa. And so it shouldn't surprise us that the, most of the, 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 the magnificent poetry in Tanakh is there to convey emotions, or perhaps more accurately, to get us to experience emotions. So when I hear Shirat Hayam, when I hear the song of the sea, I'm meant to feel awe and joy and excitement and the, the reverence that is experienced by Ze Eli Ve'anvehu, this is my God and I will praise him. When I read, when I hear Shir Hashirim, I'm meant to experience the love that is conveyed in Shir Hashirim. Sefer Tehillim, the book of Psalms, of course, conveys a gamut of emotions. And Echa is meant to make us experience the emotion of grief. And that's, I think, the reason that it's written in, um, in poetry. Okay, so we're going to see some techniques today. We're going to spend time on three techniques before we get to the actual structure of the book. And the real goal, of course, is to try to appreciate more deeply the book of Echa and what it is that we are meant to understand when we finish hearing, learning, and experiencing the book of Echa. I'm going to begin with um, a technique that we often don't pay attention to, and that is meter. Okay, meter is not something that we pay attention to. Um, meter, of course, is, uh, is defined by the amount of stressed syllables in a certain sentence, right? And we don't pay attention to it because, of course, we all speak with a certain meter, but we don't hear the meter unless someone is speaking with an incorrect stressed syllable, in which case everyone would be annoyed, right? You hear it? Okay, so when you have uh, um, uh, people speaking Properly, you don't hear it. You know, you know when people hear it quite a lot is um, when not not your community, but when Ashkenazi Americans try to speak Hebrew in Israel, right? And they stress the wrong syllable, so then everybody around hears it, and it, it it is actually I think very annoying for people to hear, right? So that's that's how we know the meter. The meter is uh, based on the amount of <coughs> stressed syllables 
in the sentence. And I'll tell you something about um, meter of biblical poetry. Meter of biblical poetry, I mean, the biblical poetic sentence is usually divided into two, and it has equal meter. Okay, equal meter doesn't mean the same amount of words. It means the same amount of stressed syllables. Okay, so we have hazinu, hashamayim, ve'adabera, v'tishma, ha'aretz, imrefi. Right, it's very balanced. That is biblical meter. Now, um, uh, there was a professor of, um, of Bible in the 1800s named Karl Buda. And Karl Buda looked at Echa and he said, well, in the Book of Lamentations, the meter is quite different than what we are accustomed to in general biblical meter. And he actually called it Kina meter, right? The meter of lamentation, which he, 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 he defined as appearing fairly consistently in a manner in which the second sentence is shorter than the first sentence. So you might have three stressed syllables in the first part of the sentence and two or perhaps even one in the second part of the sentence. I'll read for you an example from Megillat Echa. He said about 50% of Megillat Echa is built using kina meter, using this uneven meter. So listen, for example, to the following sentence. Hayu tsareha lirosh, oiveha shalu. Okay, so it's three and two. Or olileha halchu shvi lifnei tsar. Okay, so that you have this uneven meter. And you are, of course, assuming that the meter is meant to be balanced because we are accustomed to what we call balanced meter. And the effect, says this professor, Professor Buddha, is a, a peculiar limping rhythm in which the second half of the sentence sort of dies away and expires. It gives you a feeling that the person who is speaking is too fatigued, is too filled with grief to finish his sentence. Okay? So if you think about it without actually understanding the words, if you think about the rhythm, right? So you have um, one, two, three, one, two, right? And then it just ends. It ends in the middle of the sentence. And so the biblical listener, which we are all biblical listeners, who is accustomed to a certain even balanced meter, feels that the second part of the sentence is cut off in midstream. It sounds as though the, the, the speaker is choking back the second half of the sentence. You feel almost that he's too choked up to continue the sentence. And this itself conveys a feeling. Again, some of us who are less accustomed to hearing biblical poetry today might not hear it, but your average listener of biblical poetry um, in ancient times, especially in a time when they didn't necessarily have the Tanakh and they were used to hearing the words, they're going to hear that the sentence is choked back, that, they, that the, the, the sentences cannot be completed because of the terrible grief. So that is a technique, okay? That is a technique of biblical poetry that is unique to grief poetry, to what we call kina, what we call a lamentation, and it creates a certain effect without even necessarily um, uh, uh, being based on the meaning, right? So that you're already feeling the experience of crying, of grief, of choking, uh, as you experience the sentences themselves. And that's the first technique that I want to draw your attention to. It uh, appears in approximately 50% of the sentences in Megillat Echa. The second uh, technique or the second uh, poetic um, uh, um, technique that we have in Megillat Echa that I want to draw your attention to is imagery. Okay? Poetry in general uses a lot of imagery. So sometimes we'll have a simile and it's I think very powerful to use imagery because what you are trying, what, what the, what the uh, Megillah is trying to do is to make us experience 
the experience of grief. So for example, when Megillat Echa says, Ki gadol kayam shivrech, mi yir palach, as great as the sea is your brokenness, who can cure you? What I experience in my mind is the sea, crashing, mysterious, fierce, frightening, unbridgeable, you can't put an anchor in it, you're left sort of tossing aimlessly on the waves. That is a very powerful usage of imagery. When I think about the brokenness being like a sea, it throws me into the sea along with the experience of the brokenness of Yerushalayim, of the experience of mourning in the book of Echa. That's powerful. Another powerful imagery that is used in Megillat Echa, it's used actually pretty commonly, I think most people are uh, aware of this, is Yerushalayim, who is described as a woman. Right? And this is something that we see from the very beginning. In general, in Tanakh, we know oftentimes cities are compared to women. Right? And of course, ear, a city in Hebrew, is a feminine word. Right? Uh, cities are compared to women. And we have that, um, that, that imagery at the very, very beginning of the book. Echa yashva vadad, ha'ir rabati am, hayata. Kalmana, right? How is the city sat lonely? The city that was once so filled with people, she is now like a widow. Okay, and this, this imagery appears several times in Megillat Echa, so that sometimes the city is described as a widow. Who is she widowed from? Presumably from God, right? But the, uh, perhaps also uh, there's an indication that she's widowed from the people, right? That the people have gone into exile, and so she is described as a widow. What kind of associations emerge when we think of Yerushalayim being described as a widow? Well, first of all, I think it expresses her vulnerability. It expresses her economic uh, situation, her lack of viability in terms of her economic situation. She has no protection. She has no companionship. She is lonely and vulnerable. That's one aspect of Yerushalayim being described as a woman. There's another aspect as well. Sometimes she is described not as a wife who has lost her husband, but as a mother who has lost her children. Right? And we see that several times in Miguel Ateja. It's the same image, just from a little bit of a different perspective. It is still looking at the pain of the city, at the situation of the city, through the eyes of viewed, viewing the city as a woman. But in this case, she is a mother. And so we're told, Olaleha halchu shvi lifnei tsar. Her children have gone into captivity before the enemy. She says about herself, Bitulai uvachurai halachu vashevi. My sons and my daughters have gone into captivity. This is a little bit of a different image. It evokes different feelings. If the first image of uh, Yerushalayim as a widow evokes her vulnerability, both economic vulnerability and also her very existential vulnerability, the other one in which Yerushalayim is described as a mother emphasizes her pain, it emphasizes her lack of continuity, it emphasizes her fear that there will be no future. These are two different variations of the same imagery, and it's very powerful. There's one other point that I'm going to make here. Again, I don't want to dwell too long on any one point, but this is a very important point in Migilat Echa. Many articles have been written about it. I'll make one last point, and that is that the same exact imagery is also used not just to describe her loss, but also to explain her sin, right? So that sometimes we have Yerushalayim, the woman, being described here as an adulterous woman who has exposed herself, who has been promiscuous. And of course, there we talk about the alliances with other nations, but also the worship of other idols, right, of other gods. We have throughout the Tanakh this idea that 
that Am Yisrael's relationship with God is a monogamous uh, marital commitment. And of course, therefore, turning to worship other gods, a good metaphor for that is an adulterous woman. We have that in other places as well. We have that, for example, in Hosea, right? And in other places as well. And so here, this imagery is very powerful because again, it engages us, I think, on a very emotional level. We experience the city, Yerushalayim, not as some sort of inanimate place, not as just some geographical location, but rather it is personified. It becomes a person. We move with its pain. We identify with it. We can be empathetic to Yerushalayim, the woman who has both been widowed and has lost her children. But again, we can also take a step back and see her personal culpability in all of the events that have taken place. Now, again, there's a lot more to say about the use of imagery in Megillat Echa, but I want to move on to a third technique before we go on and talk about the structure of the book. The third technique also, I think, is really very important, very powerful. Without understanding it, you really are hard pressed to understand Megillat Echa, and that is the different speakers in Megillat Echa. When someone is writing a Megillah of, of lamentation, they have to choose through whose eyes are they presenting the story. Okay, And we know that Megillat Echa sort of moves seamlessly from one speaker to the other. So that sometimes we have the third person objective, like in the very first pasuk. Echa yashva vadad ha'ir rabati am hayata kalmana, right? Rabati vagoim sarati bamedinot hayata lamas, right? We have this description of the city that is sitting lonely, right? It is a third person objective account of Yerushalayim's loss. Sometimes, however, we have Yerushalayim speaking in the first person singular. Okay, this is a collective first person singular. In other words, Yerushalayim is speaking as the nation of Israel. So Yerushalayim will say, Bachurai uvetulotai halchu vashevi. My sons, my daughters have gone into captivity. It's Yerushalayim speaking about herself. Um, I was mentioned two other speakers, but I think those are the two main speakers. The third person objective about Yerushalayim and Yerushalayim speaking as the collective I. There are two other speakers. One is the individual person, which we only have in chapter three. Ani hagever ra'a oni beshevet evrato oti nahag v'yalechoshech v'lo or, right? We have I am the man who has seen affliction with the rod of his anger. It is the personal story of an individual who undergoes a great transformation in his experience of suffering, a great metamorphosis in his relationship with God in his experience of suffering. That's Paragimel. Paragimel is a magnificent chapter. It deserves at least a shiur of its own, but we're not going to get to that today. But there we have a totally different speaker. It's the only place that we have the I. There's one other speaker that I want to mention, and it's the collective we, right? Which we only have also two places in Megillat Echa. One is Parake, which I believe Rabbi Echelon will be talking about later today. Parake, Zichor Hashem Mehaya Lanu Habita Ure et Cherpatenu, right? It's listen, God, see God, what has happened to us, right? Look at our shame. It's the first person plural. It's similar to Yerushalayim speaking about herself, but again, it's speaking as an us. Then we have that also in Paragimel. I'm not going to get into that right now. What I really want to talk about <clears throat> are the, the, the switch between the objective, the third person talking about Yerushalayim, and the subjective, the first person Yerushalayim speaking about herself. This is a very interesting switch. Now again, the switch sometimes occurs rather seamlessly. I say seamlessly because sometimes it occurs even in the middle of the pasuk. Okay? So that in Parak Aleph, in Pasuk Tet, in Megillat Echa, we have the objective third person describing Yerushalayim, and they're describing Yerushalayim in, I think, a very scathing way. Tum'ata bishuleha lo zachra acharita 
vatered plaim. Her impurities are on her hems. She did not think about what would happen to her in the end, and she spiraled downward in a wondrous fashion. Ein menachem la. There is no one to comfort her. Re'e Adonai et onyi ki higdil oyev. Look, God, and see my pain, for the enemy has become great. What happened? In the middle of the Pesach, we switched speakers. That happens twice in Perak Aleph. It's going to happen two psukim later in Pesach Yud Aleph, where once again, the objective narrator is offering a scathing critique of Yerushalayim in Pesach Yud Aleph. Kol nenachim mevakshim lechem natanu machamadehem be'ochel la'ashiv nafesh Right? Her whole nation is starving. They're willing to do anything to get bread. Re'ei Hashem v'habita ki hayiti zolela. Look God and see, for I am cheapened. Well, that's one possible translation. Okay, but in the middle of the Pasuk, we have this switch from third person to first person. And from that point forward, throughout the rest of the chapter, we remain in first person. Okay? I want to say uh, something general about the first two chapters of Megillat Echa. Basically, they're split into two. The first half of the chapter are the third person objective account of the destruction of Yerushalayim. And the second part of the chapter seems to switch to first person. Why do we have these two mediums? I think that if I would, if, you know, if I would ask you all, which is the better medium? for evoking our empathy to our ability to empathize with Yerushalayim, we would all say the first person is better, right? And, and again, I mean, I think you even see it as you read through, for example, <clears throat> the, the, the differences between the first half and the second half of Perak Aleph. So in Perak Aleph Pasuk Bet, the third person objective narr narrator describes Yerushalayim crying. Bacho tivke valayla vidimata al she cries in the night and her tears are on her cheeks. Okay, ein menachem la. That's because she has no one to wipe her tears away. But if you look in Pasuk Tet Zion, in the second half of the Perak, when you have a very similar description of Yerushalayim crying, when it's told in the first person, it is much more evocative. It is much more compelling. So Yerushalayim is speaking, she says, al eile ani vochia. Eini, eini, yor damayim, ki rachak mimeni menachem. About these things I am crying. My eyes, my eyes, they pour with water, for, for a, a comforter is very distant from me. It's a much more compelling description. Why would we use the third person at all? And here I want to mention a very, uh, I think, well-known midrash. It's also a very uh, old midrash. It's, it's, a, it's a midrash halacha. It's a Tanaitic midrash. I brought it for you here in source number one. And the midrash tells us, Shlosha banim heim. There are three sons, and these three sons are three different types of prophets. Echad tava kvod ha'av uch vod ha'ben. Echad tava kvod ha'av velo kvod ha'ben. Ve'echad tava kvod ha'ben velo kvod ha'av. Right? It's a very well-known passage where we're told there are three different types of prophets. One prophet uh, represents both God's honor and Am Yisrael's honor. One prophet represents only God's honor, but is not looking to be an advocate for the people. And one kind of prophet only wants to advocate for the people and is not interested in representing God. Who's the example of the one who only wants to advocate for God? You remember? Eliyahu, right? Eliyahu. Who's the example of the prophet? And again, this is an indication that he's a failed prophet, right? Because the perfect prophet has to be able to balance. Who's the example, according to this Midrash, of the prophet who wants to advocate only for the people and not for God? Yonah, right? Who runs away because he doesn't want to bring a bad prophecy to the people. And who is the perfect prophet, according to this Midrash? Okay, everybody wants to say Moshe. At this moment in my shiur, everybody always says Moshe. And that's correct, of course, right? But this Midrash says, it's Yirmiyahu. Now, wh when I first encountered this Midrash, I went back to Yirmiyahu. I said, I don't remember that. I don't remember Yirmiyahu 
advocating for the people, right? If you look through, especially you're about to start Yermiahu, it's an amazing book, not the least of which it's an amazing book because Yermiahu has seven autobiographical sketches where he tells his story. Now in each of these, in almost all of them, he, he expresses his alienation from the people, his anger at the people, his great pain in the face of all that the people do to him, right? So to say that he's advocating for the people equally, it's a very difficult thing to say. But if you look at the continuation of this Midrash, actually the Midrash says, <coughs> where do we know that Yermiao represents both God and the people? From Echa. Yermiao tavak voda avik uch voda ben, I'm on, in the middle of the second row. Shenemar, nachnu fashanu umarinu ata lo salachta. We sinned indeed, but you didn't forgive. We're equally culpable here for the breakdown of the relationship. That's the perfect prophet. And that's what I want to say about the use of different speakers, right? What is Yermiao doing when he constructs? Perak Aleph, chapter one of Migilat Echa, using two different speakers. In the first half of the Perak, we stand outside of Jerusalem. We are the objective narrator. We're looking at Yerushalayim. We can judge Yerushalayim. We can blame Yerushalayim. We can understand it, as it were, through the eyes of God. And when we switch to the first person and we hear Yerushalayim speak, we are seeing things things through the eyes of Yerushalayim. And this is the perfect balance, okay? So speakers are very important. There's a lot more to say about the speakers, but that's just a good example of how Megillat Echa uses the different speakers in order to, uh, in order to, to, to give us an experience that is meaningful, that conveys the religious ideas that underlie the book of Echa. I want to take um, the next part of the shiur and talk about structure. Okay, so when, we, when I say the word structure, I assume some of you say, oh no, structure, right? But we know, of course, structure always reflects content, right? Form is always meaningful, especially in the Tanakh. Um, I want to talk about two different structures, one of which I assume everybody's paid a great deal of attention to, one of which maybe some of you are less familiar with. The first structure I want to talk about is the acrostic structure, right? The alphabetic structure. I mean, you can't really miss it, right? You look for one minute at Megillat Echa and you immediately note, certainly, even if you don't notice it in Prakim Aleph and Bet, you certainly are going to notice it in Parag Gimel, right? Because there we have a triple acrostic, Aleph, 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 Bet, 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 Gimel, 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 <clears throat> and so on. Okay, so Prakim Aleph, Bet, and Dalid are written in acrostics. Do we have any missing letters? Sometimes acrostics have missing letters. Do we have any missing letters? We do not. But the iron and the pay are switched. Okay, I'm not going to get into that. <laughs> I'm just, just mentioning it as an aside. Paragimel is triple acrostics. Parag hey, the acrostics disappear. But we're still left with 22 verses, which is interesting. Right, because that matches the amount of letters. In other words, if we had wanted to turn it into an acrostics, we could have. The question really when it comes to acrostics, and we know that a tremendous amount of poetic compositions are composed using acrostics. I shouldn't say a tremendous amount. Uh, certainly not in Tanakh. In Tanakh, it's not a tremendous amount. We have several Mizmore Tehilim. We have Mishlei Lamed Aleph. We have Echa. And other than that, we don't really have very much acrostics. But in tefillah, we have a lot of acrostics, right? We have a lot of acrostics. We have, for example, vidoy. We have um, uh, many piyutim, right? Anim zmirot. We have um, uh, the birchot kriyat shema, right? Uh, for Ashkenazim, I, I don't think this is true in the Sephardi Sidur. But uh, musaf is written using backward acrostics. Tikanta, Shabbat, Ratzita, Korbanoteha, Tzivita, Perusheha, right, so that the middle pasuk is, the middle uh, bracha, sorry, is written, at least the beginning part, using backward acrostics. Why do we use acrostics? On one level, it doesn't seem to be <clears throat> very good for poetry because it sort of binds the expression of the poet, right, to some degree. It's a little bit 
formal, it's a little bit binding. Basically, we're saying, say whatever you want, but make sure you start with an olive, right? So you can say whatever you want, but you have to start with a dalit here, right? So to some degree, it seems a little bit um, uh, uh, overly structured. Maybe that's part of the point, certainly in Megillat Echa. Perhaps the acrostics are there in order to give structure to something which threatens to drown us, which is so vast and it overflows to such a degree that it could, because of the inner turmoil that it expresses, it could simply drown us. And so we have some sort of formal structure in which we can limit our, our um, uh, our expression because, of course, the amount of, of grief threatens to overwhelm us. But at the same time, I think that there's really a different point to the acrostics. And by the way, it's also used as a mnemonic. In other words, one of the reasons that it's used so much in tefillah is, again, because most people didn't have sidurim. And uh, in order to remember the tefillah, sometimes the uh, alphabetic structure is, is ideal for uh, giving people that sort of jump start to the memory. But I think that there's also a meaningful idea to the acrostics, and that is that, of course, it conveys totality, right? Me'alef ad taf, from A to Z, everything that I could possibly say about the topic is contained within the acrostic structure, right? I think that this is really the primary purpose. I, perhaps the best example of this is vidui, right? Vidui, of course, well, when we stand before God on the amim noraim, we can't possibly enumerate all of our sins. And so what do we do? We say ashamnu, bagadnu, gazalnu, dibarnu dofi, hevinu, vihirshanu, is it, it's, it's the same vidoy, right? Okay, so Aleph, Bet, Gimel, Dal, and, and it, I don't know, I, I, you know, Art Scroll put out this little companion to vidoy volume, right? So when you say Ashamnu, it says, think of all of the Averot that you, that you did, that you committed with the letter Aleph, right? So that it's meant to convey totality of sinfulness. And I think that something similar is going on here in Migilat Echa in order to convey the totality of the anguish, the all-encompassing grief that cannot be expressed with mere words, even if we use the entire vocabulary of grief, we use this poetic, one might call it artificial technique in order to convey the totality of the loss. Um, <clears throat> now, the other uh, structure, though, that I want to draw your attention to, and, and this one, I, I assume less people are familiar with it, is something called a chiastic structure. Okay, chiastic is based on the Greek word chi, which is an X, and uh, a chiastic structure basically goes A, B, C, C, B, A. It could go on endlessly, A, B, C, D, D, C, B, A, okay? I'll just draw your attention to what we, what we, what we uh, call the, um, the prototypical chiastic structure here in source number two. Look at this pasuk <coughs> that, uh, that God tells Noach when he comes out of the teva. Shofech dam ha'adam ba'adam damo yishafech. You see it? It's a beautiful structure. It's A, B, C, C, B, A. And what this structure says is that anything you do comes back to you. Right? You do A, you get A. You do B, you get B. Right? Okay? Um, now, um, Professor Gabi Cohen of Barilan University discerns an internal chiastic structure in several chapters of Migilat Echa. And I brought them for you here, just so you could, you know, just so you could sort of see it briefly. We're not going to go through all of them, but look here in source number three that I brought for you. This is uh, Parak Aleph. I didn't bring for you the whole structure, but I wanted you to get a sense of what it is that he's doing here. Look at what it says in Pasuk Aleph. Rabati Vagoim, I bolded it for you. Look in Pasuk Kavbet, that's the last Pasuk. Ki Rabot Anchotai. Pasuk Bet matches Pasuk Kav Aleph. Ein la Menachem, Ein Menachem Li. Pasuk Gimel matches Pasuk Kaf. Ben Hamitzarim Kitzar Li. Pasuk Tet matches Pasuk Yute. You see, you see what's going on here, right? So that each Pasuk matches the end, right? So that it creates this cyclical structure of the chapter. I think that what the, the, the idea that underlies 
This structure within the chapter is this sense that there is an interminable experience of grief. It's cyclical and it doesn't end. The same things that I'm experiencing and feeling at the beginning of the chapter, I'm right back there at the end of the chapter. The chapter doesn't progress, at least not emotionally. If in the beginning of the chapter, Ein Menachemli, at the end of the chapter, Ein Menachemli. If in the beginning of the chapter, Bitulotai Vachurai Halchu Shevi, at the end of the chapter, the same experiences are taking place. The Yerushalayim is experiencing her children in captivity. The cycle of interminable pain from where there seems to be no out is what is experienced when we have this chiastic structure within the chapter. I will, though, draw your attention to something interesting that happens in Parak Bet. Parak Bet, here I brought it for you here in source number four, unfortunately it didn't come out on one page, so that makes it a little bit harder to see. But Parak Bet, uh, Professor Cohen says, there's a chiastic structure in Parak Bet as well. So in Pasuk Aleph we're told, Lo zachar hadom raglav biyom charon apo, God didn't remember his footstool, meaning the Beit HaMikdash, on the day of his anger. In the very last Pasuk we're told, Right? Again, we're talking about Charon Apo, the day of God's anger. If in Pasuk Bet we describe God as Lo Chamal, he did not take pity. Pasuk Kav Aleph, Lo Chamalta. God did not take pity. But uh, um, the same is true in Gimel and Kaf. But look for a moment in Psukim Dalid and Yud Tet. In Pasuk Dalid, God is described as pouring out his anger on Jerusalem. Shafach ka'esh chamato. He pours out his anger like fire. Look at the matching pasuk in pasuk yud tet. In, in this matching pasuk, the narrator turns to Yerushalayim and begs Yerushalayim to Davin in the following words. Shifchi Chamaim libech. Pour out your heart like water. Right? Again, here we have within the chiastic structure almost a way out of the cycle. Right? We don't have the same word is used, shafach, right, to pour. But if in, in, if in the beginning part of the chapter we have God pouring out his anger like fire, in the second part of the chapter, we are told there is a way out of this interminable cycle of pain, and that is tefillah. If you pour out your heart like water, you can put out the fire of God's wrath. And that, by the way, is one of the keys, the underlying ideas in Megillat Echa, which maybe we'll talk about uh, towards the end, and that is that there is a solution to the pain. Right? Megillat Echa is not a book of comfort. It's not a book which gives us a tremendous amount of relief. It's one of the problems in Megillat Echa is that, for example, the word nichama, the word comfort, appears five times in the book, right? Four times in chapter one, Ein la menachem, Ein menachem la, Ein menachem li, ki rachak mi many menachem, right? It's all in the negative. There is no comforter. It appears once in chapter two, Ma aidech uma anachamech, what could I possibly comfort you with? Right? It's a rhetorical question, which means nothing. Migilat Echa is not a book of comfort, but it does provide a certain key or a certain solution to the problem of suffering, to the problem of pain. We're going to come to that in a few minutes. But I want to make a couple more points about this chiastic structure, and that is that in my mind, the point of the chiasm is to draw our attention to the middle. The whole thing takes us to the middle. Okay, it's not just the cyclical feeling, it's also what we're focused on. And I want to make a, a general statement, and that is that oftentimes when we have alphabetic structures, if you look exactly in the middle, you're going to find an inner chiastic structure exactly in the middle of the parak. Before we see it in Megillat Echa, I want to show it to you in the two most famous alphabetical compositions in the Tanakh. One, of course, is what we call Ashrei. It's a, you know, it's a misnomer, but it's Tehilim Kuf Memhe. And the other is Eshet Chayel. <clears throat> Look in source number five on page two. 
the exact middle of Ashrei, Kevod Malchutcha Yomeru, Ugvuratcha Yidaberu, you see it? Kevod Malchutcha Ugvuratcha, Lo Di Alivne Adam Gvurotav, Ukvod Adar Malchuto, right? It's Kevod Malchutcha Gvuratcha, Gvurotav, Kevod Malchuto. It's A B B A. You see it there? Same thing in the middle of Mishle, in the middle of Eshet Chayel. Yadea Shilcha Vakishor, Vichapeha Tam Chufalech. Kapa parsaliani viadeha shilcha levyon. And we say it every, every week, right? Did you ever notice that? That right at the center, there's an ABBA structure. Okay, now, if I had more time, I would explain to you why I think this inner chiasm cuts to the very heart of each of the points of these chapters, of these poetic compositions. But I'm going to leave that for your own thoughts, right? Because I, I just don't have time to do it. But I want to show you how both in chapter one and in chapter two of Megillat Echa, the middle chiasm is the very essence of the chapter. And with that, I want, then I want to take a step back and look at all of Megillat Echa. Okay, so let's look back in source number two. What do we have here right at the middle of the chapter? We have Kol Nachim, Mivakshim Lechem, Natnu Machamadehem, Be'ochel Lashiv Nafesh, Re'ei Adonai Vehabita, Ki Hayiti Zolela, Lo Alechem Kol Ovrei Derech, Habitu Ur'u, Im Yesh Machov Kemachovi. Okay, I'm not even translating. What I want you to see is first and foremost the Re'ei Vehabita. Habitu Uru. This is not a coincidence. This is what we've seen in every single acrostic structure that I've shown you so far. Exactly in the middle, we have an ABBA structure that draws the careful reader's attention to the very heart of the chapter. What is the heart of the chapter? Now I'm going to explain to you exactly what it means. Okay, in Pasuk Yud Aleph, Yerushalayim turns to God and says, Re'eva Habita, look at me, God. Okay, what does that mean? It means God's not looking. It means we have a situation of hester panim, of God hiding his face. In order to begin the process of fixing the problem, of fixing the crisis of relationship between God and the people, we have to begin with the most minimal request, God, look at us. Okay, re'eh Hashem v'abita. Does God look at him? Well, look in the next pasuk. In pasuk you'd bet, it's an amazing thing. Yerushalayim is speaking, and she turns to whom? To the Ovrei Derech. Lo Aleichem, this shouldn't happen to you, Ovrei Derech. Habidu Ru, look at me. Okay? Who are the Ovrei Derech? Who are these passers-by? They're nobody. I mean, they're somebody, but they're nobody of significance. What are we getting a sense of here in the heart of Perak Aleph, what we're getting a sense of is Yerushalayim's loneliness. Echa yashva vadad ha'ir rabati am. This city is sitting lonely. In order to alleviate the loneliness, she turns to God and she gets no response. And then in the next pasuk, I, my sense is that she just grabs any random passerby by the lapel and she says, Re'eva habita, look at me. Habitu re'u, someone look at me. Right? At the heart of Perak Aleph, we experience Yerushalayim's loneliness. It draws our attention to the theme of hester panim, of God having uh, turned his face away from Yerushalayim, which is so prominent throughout the book. Perak Aleph is the chapter of Yerushalayim's loneliness. What about Perak Bet? If we look in the middle of Perak Bet, do we find there as well an inner chiastic structure? The answer is absolutely, without a doubt. Look in Psukim Yud Aleph and Yud Bet. <coughs> here, this came out on the same page here in source number four. Kaluva Dma'ot Enai, Yerushalayim is speaking. She says, the tears have stopped up in my eyes. Chamar Meru Me'ai, my insides are churning. Nishpach La'aretz Kvedi. My innards spill out to the ground. Al shever batami, because of the brokenness of my people. Beatef olel vionek, birchovot kirya. When the children, the babies, the sucklings 
are languishing on the streets of the city. Li'imotam yomru, they say to their mothers, aye dagan vayain, where is grain, where is wine? Bihit atfam kechalal, birchovot ir, when they languish like corpses on the streets of the city, bihishtapech nafsham, elchek imotam, when they spill out their life in the bosom of their mother. Okay, the, the, the image itself is, is, is horrific, right? It doesn't really get worse than this, but the words that are used create an internal chiastic structure. Look, nishpach atef berchavot. Atef berchavot bihishtapech. It's A, B, I'm looking at atef and berchavot as one, B, A, okay? So that the middle of Perak Bet draws our attention to no less than the children, the vulnerable children, and more importantly, the theme of Perak Bet, which is not that God has ceased looking at us and therefore this has happened, but rather Sadiq Varalo, that the children are dying, that there's no explanation whatsoever for the events of the Chorban. And this is really going to lead me to the last and most striking question that I want to ask in this shiur. And that, of course, relates to the central question of mourning, which is the theology of mourning, right? How does Echa provide us with a deeper theological understanding of mourning, of how we are supposed to experience mourning. This is the critical topic in the book. And, and I do want to say one thing just as a sort of a warning before we begin to explore the topic a little bit, and that is that Echa is not a book of theology, right? It's not Kohelet, right? It's not about trying to examine the theology of mourning. Rather, one has to scratch the, the surface to try to see what is the, 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 the attempt. How do we see the attempt to try to understand the experience of suffering from a religious perspective? Because Migilat Echa is not about theology. Rather, it is about suffering. It's about the human experience of suffering. And in order to show you this, I want to, I wanna, before I get to the, uh, the, the, the ultimate um, question of how we are meant to contend with God and view God from the perspective of a suffering nation or from the perspective of a suffering individual, I want to mention that when you look at Echa, an overview of Echa, you could view the structure of Echa in one of two ways. Either you could view the structure of Echa as marking a linear process, one that moves forward, inches forward, slowly but surely in a healing sort of way, okay? Many, many uh, articles have been written actually by psychologists on Megillat Echa. Does Megillat Echa show us a process in which human beings experience mourning? Is there a forward movement in the book of Echa? There have been Many articles called Lamentations and the Grieving Process, okay? Attempts to show that, in fact, Migilat Echa does slowly but surely move us forward through the process of grieving, which I think itself has a very important message. It suggests to us that the Tanakh is deeply concerned with the human experience. The Tanakh allows room for human be beings to experience their experiences as humans within a religious context as well. I'm not going to go deeply into that simply uh, for lack of time, um, but I, I, I do want to show you the, uh, the, the second overall structure of Echa, which I think is much more critical for our purposes, and that is that Echa is not just a book that moves forward, and it does move forward very, very, very slowly. And by the way, I will say one more thing, and that is that throughout the book of Echa, there's almost no real request of God. We have these very, very minimal kind of look God and see me moments, right? Until we get to the very, very end, right? In the very, very end, Amisrael turns to God and says, 
Hashivenu Hashem Elecha V'nashuva, Chadei Shameinu Kekedem. And we say, ah, oh, finally, a real request, a request for renewal, for rejuvenation, for revitalization, right? That's a request, not Re'e Hashem V'abita, right? But then, turns out, it's not the last Pasuk, right? It's the second to last Pasuk. The last Pasuk is, Ki im ma'os me'astanu, katsafta aleinu ad me'od, for you have surely rejected us, you have been excessively angry with us. Right? So that even when we seem to progress, we sort of fall back, right? There, Megillat Echa is a book that even biblical scholars agree that it was written quite near to the, to the events themselves. It's a very painful book. It's not a book that moves us very, very far away from the morning. And therefore, even if there is a linear progression, it is slight, okay? It's not, to, it's not, it's not a rehabilitating book. It's not a book that, that, that brings us back to where we want to be. But what I'm more interested in for the purposes of today's shiur is seeing Megillat Echa not just as a linear structure, but also as a cyclical book, okay? When I say cyclical book, I'm going back to what I mentioned before, which is the chiastic structure, okay? So we have five Prakim, five chapters in Migilat Echa. And what I want to show you is, is that the first chapter matches the last chapter, the second chapter matches the fourth chapter, and Parak Gimel stands alone. Okay? And, and I believe that if you understand that structure deeply, then you're going to understand the preeminent theological questions that accompany us in our learning of Megillat Echa, and I'll just sort of briefly outline them. Our question when we read Megillat Echa is about our relationship with God. Is God our enemy or is God our ally? Okay, this is not a simple question. God is called enemy at least three times in the beginning of chapter two, right? Hayake Oyev, right? God is described in chapter three as a lion and a bear. Dov orev huli ari bimistarim. He is a lion, wait, a bear lying in wait for me, a lion in secret places, right? God is described quite frequently in the book as part of the uh, world of the enemies. Is God enemy? Is God ally? Are we responsible or is God responsible? Have we sinned? in such a way as, to, uh, as to, to bring about this punishment? Or are we being punished unfairly and excessively? Are the people in the story angry at God or are they remorseful of their own sins? Okay, these are the, these are the critical questions. And they're ones that are not answered explicitly. And therefore, we need to look more deeply into the book itself in order to find the answers to these questions. I want to spend the next five minutes doing so, right? I have five more minutes? <clears throat> okay, I want to spend the next five minutes doing so. I, I, again, I mean, from a theological perspective, Parak Gimel stands right in the middle. I, 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 I cannot possibly do justice to Parak Gimel um, right now. I will say one thing about Parak Gimel, and that is that Parak Gimel is the only story of <clears throat> the individual, Aniha Gever, and it shows us the transformation of the individual from self-centered mourner to someone who uses his mourning to build his relationship with his surroundings and God. One intriguing point is, is that if you look in the first word of chapter three, what is it? Ani. Ani. What's the last word of chapter three? I didn't bring it for you on the paper. You have to know it by heart. Hashem, tachat shmei Hashem. This chapter moves the ani to Hashem. And it's a magnificent chapter. That having been said, that's not, that's not what I want to show you today. I want to show you the chapters surrounding it. I want to explore the relationship between chapters 1 and 5 and chapters 2 and 4. It starts with the linguistic relationship. And that's easy, because I brought it for you in charts. So I don't even have to spend any time on it, right? If you look here at these charts, what you see is that the, the, the Megillah is constructed in such a way 
as to draw our attention to the similarities between chapters 1 and 5 and chapters 2 and 4. Uh, it's not just the language that is used, obviously. It's also the subject matter, the tone of the chapter. Chapters 1 and 5 are very quiet chapters. They are lonely chapters. They are empty chapters. They concern themselves with what we have lost, what is no longer, with what, everything that has left Jerusalem. One of the critical words in both of these chapters is the word ein, right? Ein menachem li. Avoteinu chatu ve'einam. Yitomim hayinu ve'ein av. Porek ein miadam. There is nothing. Yerushalayim has been emptied. These are the only two chapters where Yerushalayim is described as a widow, someone who has lost, right? Lost her husband. These are chapters of quiet mourning, of desolation, of tears that are left on the cheeks of the personified city. And these chapters describe the suffering of all the nation, whether it's young and old, whether it's officers or common people, priests or non-priests. It's everybody. You see, they keep coming up throughout the chapter. Bachurai, Betulotai, Nar, Zakein, Kohanim, Sarim, everybody. In contrast to these two chapters, we have chapters two and four. Chapters two and four are angry chapters. They are loud chapters. They are destructive chapters. <clears throat> Look at the language that is used. They are chapters of God pouring out his wrath on Yerushalayim. And these are chapters also which focus on the blame, or the blame is focused on the leaders. It is the Kohanim and the Melachim and the Sarim and the Nevi'im who are to blame. And I know that because the ones who suffer in chapters two and four are the children, the blameless, the vulnerable, the tzaddik viralo, those who experience suffering with absolutely no way to assign them culpability. And so what I want to suggest is, is that this chiastic structure, which is both linguistic and thematic, is there to draw our attention to the theology of each of these chapters. Chapters one and five grope their ways towards admission of culpability. They don't start there, but they eventually get there. Chapter 1 leads us to the point that we can say, Tzadik hu Hashem kifihu mariti. God is righteous, for I have rebelled against him. Chapter 5 gropes its way to the words, Oy na lanu ki chatanu. Woe to us, for we have sinned. The admission of sinfulness is the point of chapters 1 and 5. The world is run by God. It makes sense. We must find sense in the world that is run by God. It must make sense even in the face of terrible human suffering. Chapters 2 and 4 never arrive at that conviction. Never. Chapters 2 and 4 never arrive at a sense of Things are right in the world. Children are dying. There is no compassion. The moral fabric of society has completely unraveled. Anger at God is inevitable. The sense in chapters 2 and 4 is that the world does not make sense. These are indignant chapters. These are chapters in which uh, Am Yisrael turns to God and says to God, Re'ei Hashem v'habita, l'mi olal tako, in tochal na nashim piryam olalei tipuchim, im yeareg b'mikdash Adonai kohen v'navi. Look, God, see what you have done. You have created a world in which the inconceivable can happen and has happened. Mothers eating their children, the sacred temple witnessing the murders of its sacred keepers, the inconceivable has happened. In these chapters, nothing is resolved. We are left with a terrible void. And what I want to suggest is that these totally different theological perceptions 
are the very point of Megillat Echa. This is the theological message of Megillat Echa. It is a dialectic. When we ask ourselves, what is the correct response to our relationship with God in the face of human tragedy, particularly within a national context, the answer is, it is a complex response. On the one hand, there is and there must be a strong reliance on emunah, the simple faith that the world has meaning, that there must be meaning, that tzaddik hu Hashem kifihu bariti, that the world has a formula for right and wrong, <clears throat> that the world is orderly. Without this type of faith, the world is dark and absurd. It is incomprehensible and evil. On the other hand, Echa does not resort to simple formula, to easy answers in the face of these terribly difficult questions. Anyone who has lived in this world, anyone who has faced the absurdity in which the human condition is framed, honestly, face on, with integrity, with a desire to use every aspect of our human experiences as humans in order to draw closer to God, to understand God more deeply, is unable to offer uncomplicated, pat answers such as everything's okay, everything's emuna, everything's fine, the death of children cannot be explained, sudden tragedy, mass tragedy, illness, pain. In the end of the day, it's inexplicable. We can't possibly properly understand it. And so it remains part of our relationship with God. And so we dance this rather complex human dance in which we encounter tragedy by moving back and forth between these two poles, this sort of interminable oscillation between, on the one hand, acceptance, a simple, pure faith in God, which are represented by the external circle of chapters 1 and 5, and on the other hand, in chapters 2 and 4, the internal circle, we remain with a sense of outrage and conf we're confounded, we are confused over the incomprehensibility of the human experience. This is, I think, Echa. It is magnificent, magnificent because of its complexity and the complex way in which it enables us to experience our relationship with God even when we are faced with human tragedy. Now, um, I don't want to leave on a dark note. I mean, it's hard to teach Megillat Echa and not to leave on a dark note. As I said, even Megillat Echa leaves us on a dark note. Thankfully, the Tzibor responds, right? After we read the last Pasuk, the Tzibor says, uh-uh, you're not leaving me there with Megillat Echa. Ki ma'os me'astanu katsafta aleinu ad me'od. And so the Tzibor, the community, responds, hashiveinu Hashem elecha v'nashuva, chadei shameinu kekedem. It's an artificial insertion by the community so that we don't leave Megillat Echa on a dark note. We do this with four books. It's Yatka, Kishaya, Utreas, Ar Kinot, and Kohelet. The Tzibor uh, responds with a positive uh, ending. And so I'll artificially end our shiur on a positive note as well. <clears throat> and that is if we, if we look in Per Gimel, right? If we look in Per Gimel, Per Gimel, of course, is the center of Megillat Echa. Per Gimel is also divided into three parts. You look at the center, right? The center of the center. I would say that center is also divided into three parts. You go to the center of the center of the center. Take my word for it. I can't show it to you right now. What do we find at the center of the center of the center? We find the word badad once again. Only appears twice in Megillah Echa. One is in the first pasuk, and what is in the center of the center of the center. And there, what we're told is, Tov la gever ki sa ol b'ni'urav, yeshev badad v'yidom. Kinatal alav. It is good for man to bear a burden in his youth. He should embrace his loneliness and use it, I'm paraphrasing now, and use it to become closer to God. And I'll leave you with this thought. Like every aspect of our human experience as humans, the Tanakh in Judaism does not want us to, to deny our humanness but rather to embrace the human experience with all of its difficulties, with all of its pain, and with all of its opportunities 
to dig deeper in our relationship with God, to use it to draw closer to God, to examine our lives and our purpose in this world more clearly, and to know that even if we do not find an answer, the answer, at the very least, we find ourselves consistently engaged in the quest to develop and explore and deepen our relationship with God and the world that he's given us. Thank you.